So this morning, I want to uh, talk about a subject called, uh, it's a very popular subject, and it's called excuses. How many of you like making excuses? Excuses. And so we are living in a time where you have to know what is God saying, what is God doing. Um, and you have to now realize that God wants to make disciples. Disciples are not just people that attend church. Disciples are followers. Disciples have a teacher that they are following. And so disciples, uh, the Bible says, go into all the world and make disciples. It's a process. The day you come under the teacher, the process begins. And so when you study uh, the Jewish customs, those disciples would be under the voice of a teacher for a period of time, and they would be tested. Tested. Now, one of the reasons why we don't do testing here is, is the teacher is too afraid of what the results would be. And so if we have to test you, uh, the, the results would be shocking. Imagine the series we're doing, which is branches running over the wall, the life of Joseph. Uh, we'll be surprised as some of the revelation we'll receive back from those questions. But discipleship is to bring you into maturity. Maturity must unlock the purposes of God in your life. When these purposes are unlocked, you now must go and make disciples. You now must become a teacher. You now must begin to teach. And so that process is from generation to generation. There's no end to it. No end to it. And so excuses are explanations or justifications given to defend one's actions, behaviors, or lack thereof. So people want to justify, people want to, to explain why their position is the way it is. And so uh, some of you sitting there must be wondering, hey, why did we pray for pastor to come back? <laughs> Maybe it'd be better if he wasn't here this morning. But Proverbs 22.13 says, the lazy man says, there's a lion outside, I shall be slain in the streets. How many of you know that is an excuse? Where are you going to find a lion in the street? Right? These become excuses. Excuses. Now, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is faithfulness is very, very important. I was sharing with a few people outside church the other day that for 21 years, Every Saturday morning from 7 to 8, I have been attending a prayer. 21 years. Never missed a meeting. If I missed a meeting, I was either in hospital or I was out of the country. But I've been there faithfully for 21 long years. Now, being truthful with you. In 21 years, the Lord has unveiled a lot, a lot. My uh, lamentation for my own life is I've been very faithfully and committed to the meeting, but not equally faithful and committed to the doctrine. I'm there. I'm saying amen. I'm listening. But how faithful am I to what I have received? I'm speaking for myself. Now, when Paul spoke to, to Timothy, he said, 
1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading exhortation to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by, the, by prophecy for the laying on of hands in, of the eldership. Verse 15, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So there's continuity that all that you've been learning and all that you've been uh, given by the Lord, you need now to teach others. But the word meditate is a very important word. A very, very important word. And so when you look at your life, if we don't uh, begin to latch on to what God is saying, your purpose on the earth will be aborted. That means at some point, the edge in your life would be broken. Serpents will come in. And, and, and your, your life and what God has given to you will die prematurely. You see, when we talk about maturity, you can't get offended by truth. Offense to truth means you're not a disciple. Now, once again, when you go back to Jewish customs, the teacher was not your friend, although he would be friendly. But the teacher was treated with the highest level of respect because he was one sent by God and given by God. And so it was not what was said, it was who said it. And so <clears throat> I want to give you two case studies as a foundation this morning. One found in Genesis 39, verse 7 to 12. The Bible says, It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what he's with me in the house and has committed all these uh, and all that he has has committed to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, no as he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, that none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So there's Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers. And we know how he was sold as a slave into a foreign nation, but this was a setup. God was setting him up. Remember the famine was about to come and God who knows all things sent Joseph before time to preserve life. He said, you sold me, but God sent me. <laughs> So Joseph was on a mission, a mission by the Lord. He was sent by God to fulfill a specific purpose and task. Yes. And so while he was there, the Bible says the Lord was with him. He was a successful man. He had great grace on his life. He had great favor. He had great uh, success. All of those things were happening for Joseph. But there comes a time where you will be tried. You will be tested. Now, he was sent by God. This is what I, I want to repeat consistently. It was God's doing. Although the way it happened may not be palatable to a lot of people because we'll complain and get angry and get frustrated and we'll say, what God is this? There is no God. And we get, we get frustrated by the situation. But 
Joseph refused to buckle under the stress and the temptation. Because every day, every day, consistently, the Bible says day by day. This wasn't a once-off thing. It happened over the period of time that he was that 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 seduction was taking place, and he was able to to overcome daily, daily, right? Joseph sent by God. Now let's look at the other case study in Judges chapter sixteen, verse fifteen. The story of Samson. Then she said to him, "How can you say I love you?" When your heart is not with me, you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. Now, this is a story of Delilah and Samson. Delilah, remember, was a prostitute. She was a Philistine. Samson's heart got connected here. Samson's heart got joined here. And so, verse 16, it came to pass as she pestered him daily with the words and pressed him. Now can you see that the, 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 the test is the same? Both are servants of God. Both have been on the earth sent to do a specific assignment. God raised up Samson to deal with the Philistines, to conquer the Philistines. Joseph was sent into the world. And so she pestered him and so that his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor shall ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from a mother's womb. I, have, I am shaven. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come upon, come once more, for he has told me all his heart. And so the lords of the Philistines came to her and brought money in their hand. Now, can you see? She sold him. And then she lured him to sleep on her knees and called for a man to shave off seven locks of his head. Now, you can symbol symbolically interpret that. There's no time for that this morning. And then she began to torment him, uh, and his strength left him. Now, can you see how he fell into temptation? And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Now, how sad is that? Men called by God, sent by God. The promises of God was locked up in his life. But how the Lord departed from him was a very, very sad story. Then the Bible says, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze uh, fetters. And he became a grinder in the prison. Br grinder means you became an employee of their system. A powerful man of God. You know how powerfully God used Samson. Look at how his life ended up. They dug out his eyes. In other words, he died blind. Could not see. And how many people today, God has put his promise in them. Is calling upon them, but they die blinded. They become employees of a system, and whatever God has placed in them dies prematurely. See how you allow the enemy to come in, and why? Because of excuses. You you are either busy. There's a lion on the street. You have no time. We make all these excuses. All these excuses. We are not serious about what we are receiving. These words are the words that will keep you. Just sitting and listening on a Sunday and going home is not enough. You, you won't be able to. You're not Einstein. 
you understand what I'm saying? The hour is, is of urgency is now. And you have to determine in your heart whether you are just going to exist because of a promise, and that promise to you is God's blessings. As long as it is well with you, as long as it is well with your bank account, as long as it is well with what you, God can give you, you are satisfied. But that's not the people God has called. That's not the promises, the promise that God has placed in your life, which I'll show you later. Because when we talk about promises, we just want to live a blessed life. Now, whether you are Hindu, whether you are Tamil, whether you are Muslim, whether you are a uh, Buddha follower, whatever, every follower wants to live well. Every follower wants, wants good health. Every follower wants tons of money in the bank. Hmm? When you travel, you, you, you see vanity all around you. You go into a country like Dubai, you see vanity all around you. They're not servants of Christ. Not serving Christ. And so what is the promise for your life? What is the promise for my life? And how long would we continue making excuses for being where we are? See, and then we blame God for what's happening. We blame others for what is happening. Not realizing that, that it, at some point in your life, you have to become serious. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now we know the reward that he looked for was Christ. And a very interesting fact to the story is when he found out his identity was in God, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. His identity was clear. And in, in Exodus 3, 1, and Exodus 3 is a story of the burning bush, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out? His first excuse he makes is his identity. How can I go? Who am I? And so you don't realize who you are in God. That you are God's son. Now, this is not for pastors. This is for everyone sitting and listening to me. That this is who you are. So you look at your life from a perspective and you make excuses. Make excuses. Uh, Exodus 4, uh, 3, verse 13, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? The second excuse is ignorance. Ignorance. How often we live in ignorance. We're not confident in who we are in God, and the message God has given to us. The word that we have received. Exodus 4.1 Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Third excuse, unbelief. Unbelief. So you are not believing. God is raising Moses up at this time to send him on an extraordinary assignment. But look at the excuses. Moses is making excuse after excuse after excuse. Exodus 4.10, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am of slow, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is inadequacy where you feel that you can't get the job done. How can I speak? 
What am I going to say? I don't have good words. My vocab is so small, etc., etc. Can you say excuse number four? Now, if I send you somewhere and I say to you, this is what you must go and do, how would you feel? Would you fear? Will you tremble? Will you be flooded with a whole lot of emotions? Would you say, no, man, I'm not ready? This is not my time. And for a lot of people, it will never be your time. Exodus 4.13, but he said, O oh Lord, please send by the hand of whomever, whomever else I send. Sorry. Oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So basically, it's time to pass the buck onto someone else. The fifth excuse is unavailability. The man is unavailable. He's making himself unavailable. Now these are common excuses that we are seeing on the earth today. That, you know, we don't realize why God has saved us, why he's brought us into the kingdom of God, and we're not allowing development to take place. We're not allowing ourselves to grow. We're not allowing ourselves to come to maturity. So one of the ways you will never grow is just by attending church, Sunday and going back. You can't grow that way. The only way you can grow is if you plant yourself by the rivers of living water. Amen. This is called buying the whole field now. You have to buy the whole field. You, you can't buy one square meter for yourself. As long as you are well, you are protected, you are preserved, you are blessed. No, you've got to buy the whole field. Now, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4 to 5, the Bible says, when you make a vow to God, the word vow is the, is the word promise, do not delay to pay it. For he who has no pleasure in fools, pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Now, there's several applications to that passage of Scripture. But I want to make clear reference today to one specific application, and that is how often in your life you promise God that you will live for him. You promise God that if you do this for me, I'll give my life to you. I'll give myself to you. Every part of my being will serve you. And we have not kept that promise. Not kept that promise. Now, if you know, better not to vow. Better not to promise than to promise. Hmm? So, come if you go into an exam room and you look at the question paper and everything is absolutely foreign to you. Never seen. Did we really study this this term? Where was I? Apparently, I was in school every day. Huh? And then you realize there is a higher order now. If God don't come through for you, you're finished. And very often, you pray a specific prayer, the prayer of the vow. Say, Lord, I promise you, I promise you, if you help me, yeah, I will give myself to you. And you leave the exam room and you forget about the vow. Forgot about the promise. Now, it's not thing, something that you, you should take lightly. Hmm? Not something you should take lightly. Th this is serious. That means your walk with God must be serious. Amen. Now, in Luke chapter 9, verses uh, 57 to 62, the Bible says that it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. Once again, several applications of the passage, but I want you to, I want you to see it this way, that one is determined to follow God. How many of you got good intentions? He's got good motives. His heart, he wants to do this. Right? But, but, Jesus is responding to him by saying, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man. 
has no way to lay his head. That means he wants his mind to be found in his sons on the earth. The mind of God uh, must be found in us. That means he wants to lay his head on us. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Very clear instruction of what he needs to do. Uh, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Then Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back his foot for the kingdom of God. That means these two fellows who had right intentions and motives were filled with excuses. Excuses will bring delays in your life. It will cause you to forget what God asked you to do. And so having good intentions and wanting to serve God and wanting to to uh, to give your life to God totally and completely is good. But you have to do it. And you have to do it immediately. You can't delay. You can't hold back. You can't wait. So, yeah, the issue is priority. Who is your priority? Who is your priority? Who are you serving? Come on now. Who is your master? So I want to really encourage you this morning that, that now is the time for you to shift. Shift. Having the right intentions is not always good unless you're able to act on it. Manifest what you are feeling. Live out. And, and when we say live out, we're talking about now. Today. Today. Amen. Now, in Song of Songs, how many of you like this book? Let's turn there quickly. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2. It's the story of the Shunammite. And uh, verse 2 says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. There's a person that is very weary, very tired, and they are sleeping, but the heart, the heart is a picture of your spirit. Is awake. Is awake. You're physically tired, physically drained. You want to rest, like uh, Chantel and myself, but your spirit is awake. Is awake. And so uh, she's in this position. It is the voice of me, my beloved. Now there's something that she's longing for. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew. Right? So very, very loving man this is. He's knocking on the door. Do you know that very often Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart? You are weary, you are tired by all that you face in life. Your heart is awake. In other words, your spirit is ready. It's willing. It wants to come out. It wants to latch on. It wants that connectivity to take place. And Jesus is also willing. Knocking on the door. Calling out to you, calling out, saying words like love and dove and all these words because he wants to connect with you, wants to be with you. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? Now, can you see excuse? Excuse. Yeah, it's like a person is unable to adjust themselves. Many people are stuck in a routine. Routine. 
if you are too routine, you'll miss God. Because you feel now it must happen in a certain way. Take, take Peter. Peter was so routine that God had to slap him from this side to that side to get him to arise from where he was. He's saying, how can these people speak in tongues? We never water baptize them. If God wants to do what he wants to do, he will do it. Then the Lord says, kill and eat. Don't call what I have, uh, what's the word? Can't remember now. But basically you're saying to Peter in Acts chapter 9 or Acts chapter 10, hey, don't play games. Don't play this religious political game. Paul would stood him to his face because when he was with the Gentiles, he'll behave in one way. When he was with the Jews, he'll behave another way. If both were there, he'll, like, he'll, he'll completely ignore the Gentiles. Hmm? Am I right? So, these excuses, are, are it's detrimental for our lives. Where we are unable to adjust. Now, it's in your spiritual life, it's also in your natural life. Because everything must be done like clockwork. We were laughing ourselves sick. There's one, uh, there's two people that were sharing a room. When I say clockwork, the breakfast certain time, they'll finish at a certain time. They must go back to the room at a certain time. They, they must be at the meeting at a certain time. It's like we can't live like that. When it comes to serving God, learn this word, become spontaneous. Spontaneous. Don't say, hey, how can I do this now? My robe is already taken off. My feet is washed. How can I now walk on the floor? How can I do this? How can I do that? Yet your heart is ready, willing. The Lord is willing. But look at the excuses. Look at the excuses. And so <clears throat> I'm saying to you this morning, hey, we can't live like this. Because you want to play catch up. You always want to catch up and catch up. And the opportunity is there. You have to seize the opportunity. The moment is there. You have to seize the moment. If not, nothing will happen for you. Nothing will happen. To, I've, I've learned this in life, not just with spiritual things, but other things. You've got to see sometimes something. But you now want to take out your calculator. <laughs> you want to calculate. You want to work out. You want to, you know, write out a summary. You want to do a report. <laughs> and then you realize that time has passed. I did not seize the opportunity. Did not seize it. And so the Bible says, My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. Heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh. On the handles of the lock, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke to me. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. There's a person that missed the opportunity. Too late. Beloved is gone. Look at the love and everything that the person has. Let me say to you, and I'm talking to our church specifically. Many of you love God dearly. Love God dearly. Your love for God is evident. Your love for the things of God is evident. We are really blessed to have good people within our spiritual family. But something is missing. This fire is not there. It's not there. If we want God to shift us quantum leaps, it can't be done without Him. Can't be done without it. And you are faithful. Faithful. 
you are committed, you are trustworthy, all of these things. I was writing a letter, you will say, wow. Wow. See, if you don't have to be here today, he's going to Joburg. Many of you don't know, every week he's in our meeting. Sunday and Tuesday. You don't have to be there. But he's there. What does it tell you? Hmm? Faithfulness. Committed. But, but, the Lord is knocking through the doctrine and the teachings and you are missing your opportunity. Missing it. Because you are not serious. You will have one day or two days you say, All right, Lord, I am going to start. You are making a promise and a vow. Two, three, four, five days you forgot. Forgot. Now, all the words that you have received is to build you up, to establish you, to bring you to a certain place in Christ. Hmm? Don't miss out now. Don't make excuses. If you have to put a timetable, put a timetable. Write it on a calendar. Say, Lord, right now I'm starting small. Don't start big. You make a promise. Make a promise. Don't make a big promise. Say, Lord, you know what? This, this week here, yeah, 10 minutes. Starting 10 minutes. I'm going to take this message. I'm going to devour this message. Hmm? Increase it slowly. Slowly, slowly. Problem is you set the bar so high. Say, Lord, one hour. After 15 minutes, you can't make it. Can't make it. So, <clears throat> this woman now, the Shunammite. The Bible says, the watchman who went about the city found me. They struck me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am love sick. See, when she opened the door, no one was there. You know what she did? She pursued. She ran out the way she was. Ran out. The way she was and she pursued and pursued and she got the hiding of her life. Because the watchmen are asking, what are you doing here? At this part of the night, she was falsely accused of being a prostitute. Hmm. But you know what? She said to the people, if you find my beloved, she never said, tell them how much of hiding I got, how I am wounded. These are the problems. No, no, no. What did she say? The instruction was clear. Tell my beloved, I am love sick. Now, how's that for passion? How's that for a life-changing moment? And let me say to you, the Lord will visit again. That person. That person. Amen. Because we have to come to that place. I mean, you take the ten virgins. How is it that five had oil and the other five did not have oil? How is it five made the visitation, the other five missed the visitation? Hmm? What would their excuse have been? No time. I wanted to do it, but someone came to visit. Many people are very distracted. You don't know how to seize the opportunity. You don't know how to seize the moment. Hmm? And so the card we play with God is, Lord, you know how faithful I am, how committed I am. You know how I've given myself, I've given my life, I've taken my family with me, I've done this, that, 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 that. But you're faithful just to be in the environment. You're not faithful with what the environment produces. Hope you're hearing me this morning. Amen. Because a man that had every reason to be fed up, frustrated, and say, no, man, this thing, yeah, if it happens, it happens, is Abraham. 99 years old. If you read 
Genesis 17, he receives such a powerful promise from God that your name, I'm changing it from Abraham, which is exalted father, to Abraham, which is father of many nations, and through you, this is what's going to take place on the earth. How do you believe God after you have waited for 99 years? How many of you will still believe? Take Caleb. Caleb was born in Egypt. He was born in environments where foreign gods were served. But when he heard the word of the Lord, hey, he never allowed that word in him to die. He said to Joshua, give me the mountain the Lord promised me. He waited 45 years. He was 85 when he asked for the mountain. How's that? My strength is as it was when I received the promise. How do you maintain your strength? How do you keep your faith up? How do you keep your joy up? How do you keep your excitement up? How do you keep your eyes on Jesus when you're seeing every day there's a funeral you have to attend? Hey, people wanted to stone you. Look at all that Caleb had to face over a period of time. But Caleb says, hey, I am not ready to give up yet. This thing the Lord promised me in my heart, I've kept it. It is burning inside of me. How do you keep that oil burning? Because he was not without problems. When Moses delayed to come down because he was in the presence of the Lord, Caleb did not join the others. He was not interested in, 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 in coming up with a quick fix. No, his heart was in God's word. Because he knew that the substance of God was in what God says. Now, many of you know that God has spoken over your life so many times? The substance of what God says is what God wants to bring to pass. But we forget the substance. And we live in a realm called excuses. And you get frustrated quickly. You get angry quickly. You get bitter quickly. You lose hope quickly. You lose faith quickly. And you know what's happening is you're going in a circle. Okay, because you're a complainer. Complainer. And within our family, although you don't complain directly, complaining is a problem. Don't think I don't know. And so we're just going in a circle. Round and round, like a merry-go-round. Not realizing, hey, God already said it. The substance is in what he said. Don't look for another prophetic word. And every week, the substance that God has given to you, God is, is, is giving you the wisdom, the grace, the mercy. He's showing you how the substance will be fulfilled. But how are we responding to that? How are we responding to that? Now, in Genesis 18, as we close this morning, the Bible says, The Lord appeared to him by the terebin trees of Mambre, and he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. That means in the hottest part of the day, there's a visitation. Hmm? The Bible will talk about three men. Now, we know in this, in this uh, uh, triology that, that it was the Lord who metaphorically visits Abraham. Hmm? Because one of the verses, if you read it, he says, my Lord, he doesn't use small L, it's capital letter. This is a visitation from God. And even it came in the form of three men in the flesh. God had embodied them through this visitation. And so, the Bible says, he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, now, this is what I want you to see. The Bible says, he lifted up his eyes. And the Bible says, set your mind on things above where Christ is and not the things on the earth. That's what the Bible is talking about. You can look naturally. 
and you can see naturally, but the day you lift up your eyes, everything in your life looks different. For example, you're going through all these issues in life, and all you can see is problem after problem after problem, difficulty after difficulty after difficulty, but the day you lift up your eyes, what you see is different. Is different. And so he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold. Now many people miss the visitation because they are unable to look outside of what they are facing. You are unable to look outside your fear, outside your doubt, outside your anxiousness, outside everything that the world is trying to, 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 to trap you in, to derail you from, 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 from activating the promises of God. And <clears throat> the Bible says, when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, bowed himself to the ground. Now the key word is the word ran. See what happens here? 245 Stonebridge. We are going to ask now. No man, this can't be God. Hottest part of the day. God don't walk this part of the time. We will find so many excuses not to respond. You know how many times the Lord visited through his word? But there was no response. Same thing. When Christ is led out of the scriptures, you have to respond. He didn't stroll. He didn't walk backwards. A 99-year-old man ran. Whether he ran with his walking stick or what, I don't know. The Bible says he ran. Now, that is the, the, the first response. You notice no excuses, nothing. Ran. Bible says, and he said, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. He was so worried and concerned about missing this moment in God. That was his concern. He says, please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest your servants under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts after that you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So this was his concern. He was not willing to let the Lord pass by just like that. Hmm? Now, laziness in the, in, the, in the life of a believer is, is too huge. Too huge. This guy here was determined. Determined. Amen. So the Lord responded favorably. He says, okay, as you have said, this is what you must do. So Abraham hurried. Everyone say hurried. Into the tent. To, uh, into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. Now this auntie is old, also almost 99 years old. There's no problems here. So first it was himself. Then it was his family. Hurried. Quickly. No time to play games. This story sets up Abraham's life. Sets up Abraham's life. Amen. So, then Abraham ran to the herd. Everyone say resources. Hmm? Can you see his life, family, now nah, his resources. He runs into his business to see what he can draw to serve God. Hmm? Quickly, swiftly. No time to play games. Hmm? Very powerful story. We're just rushing through it this morning, but please go and study it. Well, I'm sure you definitely will study it after today. 
Abraham ran to the, took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them and stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, everything that Abraham had done, he had done with acceleration, speed. Now, we struggle with small things. How many of you at sometimes feel like saying amen? Now, let's be honest now. Like you want to. But you just, you just missed that opportunity. Huh? Simple thing. Simple thing because many times I felt like saying amen for something and somehow you get distracted or something happens and you, you don't say it. And it was a time for you to have said it because you were agreeing with what God said to you. So in a meeting, you have to be switched on. There's another problem, which maybe we'll deal with one of the weeks. You need, maybe we have a dialogue. You tell me why you switched off. Hmm? Because I know you're not switched on. How is that for honesty? I know you're distracted. So be ready. Tell us honestly. Pastor, I don't know why. I want to confess to them quickly that I'm switched off. So you're going to miss what God wants to do. And then we're going to play the game of God, but God, you're not there. Look at my situation. Look at my circumstance. Look at what's happening. You, you understand what I'm saying? And then you, you're not serious about the hour, about the visitation. Because after this, the Lord said next year this time, this is what's going to happen. He confirms the promise that God had given. But when we talk about promises, promises in your life, what are the promises? Because very often for many people, they just feel now the promise is that a better life. What is a better life? Is there a better life outside God? Because when Jesus was, was full of the Holy Spirit, he was led in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil promised him kingdoms, wealth, a lot of things. Jesus responded by saying, it is written. It is written because there's a promise that comes from that which is written. It's the substance of God that must begin to manifest itself in our lives where we are able to live life from Him. Live a life that God has called us to live. There's a different kind of life that God wants us to live. Amen. And so if we can come together as a family, one heart, one mind, extraordinary things would begin to happen within our environment. Amen. But for today, I want you to, to, to <clears throat> increase grace in your life. And how are you going to increase the grace in your life? You have to now begin to meditate on what God is saying. You have to become serious about it. Serious. Respond. Respond quickly. Swiftly. Hurry. Make haste. Don't make excuses. A lot of young people are saying, oh, when I get older, now let me enjoy some life. Let me enjoy. We bumped into the, the pastor that, was sh that shared his testimony uh, on a Thursday meeting of how his son that was turning 18 years old died. Wrong place, wrong time. He used the money his father gave him. Squandered it on things he was not supposed to buy. 
Maybe he said to himself, hey, you know what, right now, let me enjoy some years. One day, I'll give my life to Jesus. Hey, how many people don't have that opportunity? Hmm? How many people say, no, let me, let me just chill for now? No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You've got to hurry. Make quick. Be swift. Do all these things so you don't miss your time and your moment with God. Because when you look at vanity, vanity can give you so much of things. But everything fades away. The richest man on the, on the earth will call it vanity. Look at the wealth he had. Extraordinary wealth. But to him, hey, this means nothing. Means nothing. Absolutely nothing. What's important to you? Hmm? Because for me, the promise is fulfilling what God has asked, what God has put into my life. If God says that you are going to be in business, that business must fulfill the promises of God in your life. You'll have challenges, you'll have difficulties, you'll have to walk through valleys, you'll have to walk through mountaintops. But the reality is the substance of what God said must come to pass. And the only way you're going to do it is not by the sweat of your brow, you have to do it by, by living from Him. Yes, you have to work hard. Yes, you have to be diligent. Yes, you have to manage what God has given to you. You can't just take it for granted, no, but this month I'm giving a big offering. All would be well. And you now going to work 9 o'clock. You're relaxing. You're chilling. Even if you're reading Psalms under 19 every day. Hmm? And you're supposed to be managing. You're reading Psalms 119. Thy word is a lamp. And by the time we come to Psalms 105, verse 105, Eh? what you got, you can't trust anyone. Anyone, you think this person is diligent and faithful, wait till your back is turned. Then you'll see how faithful someone is. Hope you're hearing me this morning. We are about to shift into some extraordinary things. Not reign through Christ. The remnant that is in Christ. Remnant that is in Christ. Ones that have been faithful to this message. Let me say to you, this is the most difficult message to follow. This is what makes it from God. Hmm? Most difficult. But we are going to see extraordinary things taking place. Acceleration. Sons from this house will travel the earth preaching, teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Hmm? Why mustn't it happen? Why can't it happen? Come on now. Huh? The last trip cost us well over 100,000 rands. 90% came from this house. Whatever you need is in the house. You have to believe that. How can a seed disappear? How can a seed fall? If you sow the seed, you must water the seed. Amen. I want you to be very excited. But let's stop making excuses. Let's stop complaining. Let's stop murmuring. Maybe at some point in your life you're at a, at a crossroad where you need direction. You're most welcome to consult with me. Don't ask the Bowser boy filling petrol. Don't ask your hairdresser. Right? If you need spiritual guidance, direction, I am making myself available. Let's not live at the crossroad. Let's trust the Lord. Maybe the Lord won't give us the answer immediately. But you can be rest assured, we will seek the face of the Lord. Hey, there's no time to play games now. We want to see people come up, 
people prosper, people find their place in God, because in that, the substance of God manifests in our lives. Amen. Come, let's stand as we pray this morning.